come here. Probably <coughs> uh, uh, more detail about the case I'll be giving you in the week. For those of you who got your notes from the Copy Center, number the six. I think the one that says PDF, I'll have that number on as well. Okay. So, uh, 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 don't worry about this stuff. Um, we should remember the difference between an adhesion molecule called a selectin versus an adhesion molecule uh, uh, called uh, an integrin. So L1 <coughs> is an integrin. Uh, selectin uh, is a uh, selectin. These these selectins sort of light adhesion. The integrins <coughs> could be back and forth between a low affinity state and a very high affinity state. And the integrins can also use intercellular safety. And <coughs> all that LFA1 is an integrin. Okay. Uh, don't worry about the detail of the biophotesis that we went into. Don't worry about the page 86. Um, we're on page seven. Now, you'll know that there are three major professional antigen presenting cells: dendritic <coughs> cells, macrophages, and B cells themselves. The expression of what kind of a molecule um, on a professional antigen presenting <coughs> cell, um, as opposed to, I mean, certainly we have an NMHC molecule, of course. But what's the other main <coughs> important molecule that makes a cell a professional antigen presenting cell? Anybody, anybody remember or anything? B7. B7. So was it B7? One, once, twice, yes, three times? All right, B7. The B7 molecule <coughs> is what makes these cells a professional antigen presenting cell. So here's the antigen presenting cell down here. It has an MHC molecule and it's presenting a peptide. But very importantly, it has a B7 molecule for which there is a receptor. And the T cell is going to get the, is going to fire from the T cell receptor, I mean the peptide MHC. And then from the partner of B7, you will remember is CD28. Actually, I'm being kind to you here, so as you look, there's a family of receptors in the family of B7, but I'm about B7, CD20. Okay. And you need the peptide plus MHC and the B7. Now, we also need to remember that T cells are sensitive little creatures and they're easily overstimulated. Okay. Triggered, I guess we could say. Uh, so that as soon as they start firing off from their CD28 molecules, pretty soon it's going to be just too much. <laughs> Stop. Well, its earliest response is to, to, to getting a CD28 signal from B7 is to turn on the gene for a CTLA4 molecule. CTLA4 molecules here, um, they look like CD28, so they'll bind the B7 molecules but whereas the CD28 molecule sends an activating signal, you will remember that the CTLA4 sends an inhibiting signal. So it can have a the response. Okay. And so I said the key thing that makes a cell a professional antigen presenting cell is the expression of B7. Now, um, in some of these cells, Actually, maybe, for example, the, um, the dendritic cells, which are tissue resident, they don't really express too much B7 at first. It's only in the context of an infection that they start ramping up the expression of B7 and then they migrate to the lymph nodes and so forth. And what is it on, any, uh, on these three cells? What receptor is used to trigger the recognition of a bacterial infection going on and therefore the production of B7 so they can start to probe? Anybody remember? You've talked about it many times. Mm -hmm. 
Toll-like receptors. Toll-like receptors recognize bacterial body parts. In particular, for example, the polypolysaccharide. So that you only become, many of these cells become really turn pro only in the context of a bacterial infection or a viral infection or something like that. And they recognize that there is a bacterial infection going on. As I, I see, I mean, if they see foreign proteins, they not, not have to get too concerned about that actually. But if they see foreign proteins and bacterial body parts, uh, they go, wow, okay, ramp up B7, start turning on the adaptive immune system. Okay. Now you will remember also, we talk here about, you know, I have them immunized rabbits for various reasons. If we had, had simply injected a foreign protein into their, under their skin or something, not much would happen. We take that purified protein that we put to purify in our lab, and we mix it up with a mayonnaise-like stuff called a juvent. And a key feature of what's called a complete foins of juvent is bacterial body parts from the polysaccharide. So that then is going to activate the toll-like receptors, and now they do with the macrophages and so forth. They're going to turn pro. And, and so that's the function of, of using the juvent to fool the rabbit into thinking you actually you've got an infection going on there. That's, I should have injected your phone protein. Okay, and this is all about that same story. Okay, you know, the whole life receptors. Um, uh, we, we talked about the, uh, uh, several occasions, I want you to know this for the test, just simply, uh, uh, what are the, most transcription factors, they're synthesized and they go into the nucleus and they live in the nucleus associated with the DNA or chromatin or whatever. An unusual transcription factor is NF kappa B. You have family members here. NF kappa B lives out in the cytoplasm. What's it doing out there? Well, it sure can't turn on genes, okay? It's kept from coming into the nucleus because it's got a protein bound to it, an inhibitor of protein, remember? That inhibitory protein covers up the passport signal that this transcription factor would need to get into the nucleus. And we use NF kappa B for systems like here, in fact, it's coming to play with the toll light receptors. An important part of the toll light receptor signal transduction pathway is to destroy the inhibitor protein on, on NF kappa B. Now, NF kappa B can come into the nucleus and turn on the genes for B7 and make more MHC2 as well. So, just broadly know, and that type of normally lives in the cytoplasm in response to an activating event, in particular, for example, toll light receptor signaling, it is able to we destroy the inhibitor and now it can come into the nucleus and turn on the, the genes. Okay. And don't worry about all this extra stuff on toll all different kinds of toll light receptors. Don't worry about. <coughs> about polymaths in there, interesting story there. And then we talked about these, I'm going to add to, you know, we talked about the hydrogenic cells, the kind of infection, upregulate B7, come into the lymph node, turn on T cells. Uh, B cells also become professional antigen presenting cells because they need T help for cell health. And they also, so the same thing where the B cells, it's got the antigen, so this is the one B cell that makes an antibody against this particular antigen. Uh, this B cell also has toll-like receptors. So if this big B cell sees the antigen in the context of bacterial body parts, it will upregulate B7. That's what was the class two. And then we went into the, a little bit of the sort of, uh, Excruciating details uh, on the signal construction events. You will remember that SH2 domains bind phosphotyrosine. SH2 domains bind phosphorylated tyrosine phosphorylated proteins. SH2 domains recognize and bind phosphorylated tyrosine. SH2 domains bind P tire. I won't say it a third time. There are certain sequences here 
called ICAM sequences on this signal. And the T, T cell receptor organ itself doesn't have, has not really been able to do anything. It's these accessory proteins, the so-called CD3 complex protein, that have long enough cytosolic tails to reboot the signal transduction molecule. And they have ICAM, these are certain amino acid sequences that contain a tyrosine uh, that are going to be recognized uh, uh, for, uh, for tyrosine phosphorylation. You're going to remember that the early events are SARC initiated by what are called SARC family tyrosine kinases. Not SARC itself, but molecules that are almost identical to SARC with names like a pin and lick. That would be a question like that. That's true or false? The earliest events of signal transduction in T cells involves SARC family tyrosine kinases. True or false? True. Um, maybe you should remember ZAP70 is kind of like the peak guy that gets activated here. And all these things happen, and then boom, we activate ZAP70, and then, then from that we have these cascades that are turned on. Um, including the phospholipase C gamma phosphate pathway. The main thing I want to know about the, the CRC, PLC gamma, PLC gamma pathway here. And here is PLC gamma. It's being turned on by the, uh, ZAP70, actually. These are various ways to do it. It's being activated by ZAP70, okay? And it's going to create uh, a, a small molecule intermediate called IP3, which is going to open calcium channels. So the PLC gamma pathway makes the cell go from having essentially unmeasurably small amounts of free calcium in the cytosol to having a lot of calcium in the cytosol. All the calcium is like there's lots of calcium inside cells, but it's all sequestered in the lumen of the endoplasmic particulate. And now we're going to open the channels and comes rushing out of, the, of this organelle compartment, gets into all the cytosol here, and it's going to turn on a number of things. That have calcium is going to activate a, 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 a special protein kinase. I'm not going to worry about that. In our, in our program, we're going to particularly remember that this calcium activates calcineurin. And calcineurin is going to activate NF kappa B. And then, I'm sorry, NFAT. Sorry about that confusing speaking. NFAT. Nuclear factor. And activated T cells. So all this is happening in the nucleus here. When NFAT is turned on, then that's going to turn on the expression of IL2. IL2 is T cell growth factor. IL2 is T cell growth factor. IL2 T cell growth factor. Anybody remember which interleukin is sometimes called B cell growth factor? I have four. Two, four, six, eight. Four. Two is T cells, four is B cells. Signaling is going to be turning on the activating the transcription factors we need to make to start making and releasing T cell growth factor IL2 and actually a component of the receptor which is needed. So we, we now are going to make a lot of IL2 and make a functional interleukin 2 receptor. Okay. So all these signals are needed to the process of activating a T cell, but one more thing is needed. 
we've got to secrete T cell growth factor, and the T cell growth factor will feed back here, and that gives a third essential signal that you actually have to have. And the, the CD28 molecule here, it's all about IL-2 here. It, it stabilizes the IL-2 mRNA about 20 fold. So again, we're going to start secreting a ton of IL-2 until it comes back and then activate the cell that was actually secreting it, as well as any nearby T cells. Don't worry about the death and the death growth stuff I talked about down here. I just thought you would be interested. Now, this step right here, calcineuron, the phospholipase C pathway, is going to be it's going to activate calcineuron. And calcineuron is going to is then going to turn on one of these transcription factors in FAT. Well, this immune suppressive drug that permits us to do kidney transplants and heart transplants is called cyclosporin. It acts by blocking calcineuron. You will remember that. Cyclosporin blocks calcineuron. So no T cell growth factors are going to be produced. And um, don't worry about all the details here. Just remember <laughs> calcineuron binds the proteins, the cyclosporin. It binds calcineuron and inhibits it. Cyclosporin binds calcineuron and inactivates it. Okay. Now there's another very widely used uh, in the in immune suppressive drugs for doing organ transplants. And it's called rapamycin. And rapamycin acts in a different way. So calcineuron blocks the production of IL-2. Rapamycin blocks the action of IL-2. And the action of IL-2 involves the activation of a very important sort of major controller protein kinase inside of cells called the Tor kinase. I always think of some Greek god or some sort of Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Tor. Okay. Uh, Tor gets its name. Anybody remember what Tor stands for? Target or rabomycin. <laughs> Rapamycin binds target of rapamycin. And don't worry about the next page. Don't worry about the next page. Um, uh, you know, if we if, a, if we have an antigen presenting cell that's not expressing B7, well, if this T cell is not going to be able to respond, not only is it unable to respond, but in fact it says, well. I'm never going to respond and become paralyzed, okay? So it becomes energy. And uh, then we talked about a little bit more details on how to run CD4 T cells. We've said a thousand times that when activated, they can become, they can differentiate, differentiate into T helper 1 or T helper 2. T helper one, um, one of the major things helper one does is to activate macrophages to fight intracellular bacteria like, like leprosy or tuberculosis. You can fight these, these bugs, these bacteria, get into macrophages and live happily there. The only way we can get rid of them is to turn up the heat and T helper one cells, the cytokines that they secrete, makes the infected macrophages that those cells makes them produce like industrial strip bleach and stuff like that. So we're able to kill the previously happily living 
leprosy or tuberculosis bacteria. You'll remember that by the test. The alpha-1, leprosy and bacteria. Leprosy and <laughs> TB. Okay. So if you have a leprosy infection, you, 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 you go in the right direction to a T helper one, you do it, you control it. If for some reason, or nice to make a mistake here, they turn on the helper two response, they cannot control the leprosy bacteria or tuberculosis. Okay. I said, um, we said that, um, so that was activating CD4 T cells. When it comes to activating CD8 T cells, I said that the cell uh, makes it harder. I mean, the, you make some mistakes with the alpha 2 cell, you, know, you get by maybe. You do not want to activate CD, uh, you, don't, you don't want to turn on CD8 killer T cells by mistake, okay? That, that's got to be very deliberate and conscious and make sure it's, you know, it takes a hard push on it to make it start. And that's what these are all about. I said you don't need to know the details here. Just remember, it takes a hard push to turn on CD8 T cell for obvious reasons. Okay. Don't worry about the um, the analogical synapse. Don't worry about 10-6. Um, here's again IL2 T cell growth factor. IL4. B cell growth factor. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why I circled that. I should have circled this one right here. Growth of, of B cells. Oh, yes. And you will certainly remember, pretty much, don't worry too much about the details here, I think, but certainly remember that cytokines, okay, interleukins, generally speaking, they, they activate what's called the famous jack stat <coughs> pathway. Okay? Uh, the receptors activated by tyrosine kinase, a tyrosine kinase called jack, and then jack activates transcription factors which are in the cytoplasm, actually, and then when it's fully in front of the nucleus and do their job. Cytokines activate the jack stat pathway. And now, the, um, the T cell is still here. So the three types of effector T cells, CD4 T cells, um, CD8 T cells, which become killer T cells, CD4 T cells, sometimes called T helper zero, they become then T helper one or T helper two. If you go this pathway, these T helper one cells secrete molecules that inhibit going to this pathway. If you choose this pathway, will produce things that inhibit this pathway. So these things are mutually inhibitory here. You go, you go one way, you tend to stabilize it that pathway and inhibit the other pathway. Okay? And T helper one cells, uh, intracellular bacteria, right? Tuberculosis, leprosy. Okay? And the other kind of infection is going to infect mostly with anna, with, with antibodies in many ways, so it's going to be the T helper 2 cells to help the B cells make antibodies. Okay. And the CD8 T cells, they are the license to kill guys. 007. Um, <coughs> I want to emphasize that will be a question asking you to remember that when a killer T cell uh, comes across a target cell, it's not going to release these little nasty molecules all around, it's going to go right. It's going to go right up close to that target cell, and release them right on top of it. So very directed, and, and, they're, and it's going to reorganize the cytoplasm such that the organelles, the ER and the Golgi, so they're all lined up. Nucleus, the organelles, target cell. Okay, and then we're going to release the cytokines directly in this little patch right here. Um, and of 
course, the Cotiso, this goes uh, and, uh, administers this sort of, you know, and do this like kiss of death uh, on the target cell. So come up, kiss it, move on, kiss it, move on. And once it's been kissed, it's fine for a little while, but it's a it's dead man walking from that point forward. It's irreversibly going to die. And we talked about the details here. The killer T cells have two ways of initiating program cell death. Is. One is by secreting these, these, um, these, 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 these granzymes and, uh, and um, uh, perforins. So we, that would bring the, the granzymes into the target cell. It activates the apoptosis pathway. Or it also has these, these death ligands called the FAST ligand that bind to FAST receptors. Okay. Um, FAST receptors become activated. I form a trimers, three of them come together. And we then again initiate the caspase activation program for program cell death. Um, the purple is here, the assembly, caspase is passed through, the, the granzymes pass through, and the granzymes activate these special uh, proteases called caspases. <coughs> People, I might have a little question, two or both, or something like that, about uh, uh, you know, fast molecules activate tyrosine kinases. No, 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 no. All right. Caspases activate death signaling. I don't know tyrosine kinases <coughs> at all. It's cleavage of pre inactive proteases, you know, active proteases. Okay. Now, mitochondria have a big role in program cell death. Okay. And both the external pathway involving the gas and so forth and internal pathways. Both of them can also then, uh, especially the internal pathway, involves mitochondria. There's a molecule here that lives in the space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. It's an electron transport protein called cytochrome C, involved in oxphos and so forth. And I told you, it steps into a telephone booth and emerges as a superman who leaves the mitochondria, comes out into the cytosol, and he's a double life. In the cytosol, he's a killer, okay? Uh, he activates the program cell death pathway. Now, there's a protein called BCL2. You should remember BCL2. BCL2 is protective. Okay? So, there are other mitochondrial proteins which are going to cause the release of cytosol. These guys have been very expressive names like BAD, <laughs> okay? okay? BAD will open channels to release cytochrome C. If you have damaged DNA, it will turn on genes that will activate the expression of the BAD protein. The BAD protein will bind to the membrane of the cytochrome, of the mitochondria, and cytochrome C can come right on out, okay? BCL2 blocks BAD, okay? BCL2, good, BAD, BAD. In our families of BCL2, uh, you know, pro survival, and other families that have names like BAD, they have names like BAX and Blake and so forth, which are program. Don't worry about all this stuff. Don't worry about all this stuff. Now, I told you, I will ask you to, to remember that we have the external pathway involving famously FAS. Partner fast leading. Um, and then an internal pathway generated internally by DNA damage or signals of the cells becoming cancerous, but will turn on the expression of backs or bad. Okay? And then in this case here, it's, it's, it's the, the backs or bad will come in here and form channels. Uh, however, BCL2 blocks bad and, and protects us from that. And in side of cells, you usually have more BCL2 than. So it's getting a little bit, feeling a little under the weather, not so great, you'll find that there's 
lower levels of ECL2 and the higher levels of, of, of BAD, if you, and if you form an excess of BAD, the BAD can form homodimers, and that will make the channels to release cytochrome C. And then cytochrome C is released, and it activates uh, this um, uh, uh, executioner caspase called caspase 3. Well, it does it via caspase 9. And here uh, we have a caspase 8. Here is caspase 8. So fast activates an initiator caspase called caspase 8. The internal signaling okay, uh, activates uh, caspase 9. So caspases 8 and 9 are initiator caspases, and they both funnel into caspase 3, which is a big time. He's the, uh, he's the godfather. Okay? He's, uh, he's the executioner guy. He then uh, activates his own minions and so forth, and they then go ahead and initiate all the little sub subroutine programs for the, for the cell death. So remember caspase 3 executioner, eight nine initiators. I think there are eight is external signaling and nine is internal signaling. <coughs> don't worry about this page, don't worry about this page. Don't worry about this page. Um, when we come to page 11B, and uh, here we're looking about what T1 cells do. And it's all about killing um, tuberculosis or leprosy bacteria that are living inside of the phagosomes, inside of the macrophage here. So the macrophage see bacteria, they eat those bacteria, that's their job. But this, in this case, the bacteria live on inside of them and replicate inside of them. And T1 uh, is able to secrete uh, cytokines to be on gamma or gamma uh, that will turn on uh, a mechanism to, to kill the bacteria that are living inside. T helper one, so this process of um, mycobacteria, which will have leprosy and tuberculosis. Also, they help um, um, uh, killer T cells respond to virus infection. And don't worry about page 1113. Don't worry about page 1114. Again, helper two cells here. This is what T helper cell two cells do. Well, and one of the things they secrete is. IL4, 2, 4, 6, 8. IL4 is B cell growth factor. Okay. It's going to make this B cell to be able to proliferate. And also some other cytokines that are involved in, in class switching decisions. Uh, um, um, Maybe graduate students, I'll, maybe I'll have you know this stuff on page 11 and 15 here. Uh, using um, uh, what's called uh, the vaccine for certain bacteria, like influenza bacteria here. Um, have a viscous mucus all pockets, all over. But the best way to get uh, immunized them is to have your bacterial sugars coupled to a, a, a toxoid carrier protein. Okay. Let's not. Okay. Now, let's beat that lecture nine and out here. Finish the T cell detail. Now, B cell detail. Okay. The, the IgM expressed by B cells functions as uh, the T cell receptor for T cells. It's going to recognize the foreign antigen and 
then fire. Just like the T-cell receptor by itself doesn't do too much. It's the accessory proteins that pop around the base of this receptor. In this case, they're called Ig alpha, and Ig beta, so IgM, which is the antibody, and they have alpha beta proteins, and these have long sized log tails that can recruit three more times up the molecules. Now, if you have, I said, if you have closely spaced antigen, I've emphasized that for all the <coughs> cells are going to get a, a growth factor sigma to, to grow. The growth factor receptors always have to at least have some more dimers okay, to become activated. And so here, um, you're getting not just dimers, but oligomers here, but you're going to bring receptors close together to bring in these sarc tires and kinases that pump up against them and become activated. Okay. So here, the B cell signal the natural pathway here is pretty much the same story as for the T cells. Um, I gave you in this lecture more detail on the on the Sark family tires and kinases that come into play here. Okay. Um, and I, I called your attention, I showed this, this was this guy was actually in the T cell receptor signaling pathway, but we didn't comment on it. This is a famous protein CD45. Okay. And CD45 is a phosphatase. And in particular it's a phosphotyrosine phosphatase. It only removes phosphates from tyrosine side chains. So CD45 is a very famous phosphotyrosine phosphatase. And the Sark family tyrosine kinases, shown here in cartoon form, they are kept in an inactive inhibited state. I have no details on this. So here's the new terminal end of the Sark family kinases, domain, domain, catalytic activity, tail. There's a tyrosine here near the tail, and, and, it, and we have an internal SH2, SH2 domains by phosphotyrosine, okay? It's binding this internal phosphotyrosine, we put the strain on the catalytic tyrosine kinase domain, and therefore it's inactive. And CD45 is gonna cut that phosphate off, and now with the phosphate gone, the SH2 releases its hold on it, the whole thing can straighten out, reduces the strain on the catalytic domain, and now we can go to one of phosphorine carbon proteins. And these are sharp itself, or fin, or lake, or blick, any of the SARC family members. And they have to be dephosphorylated to become activated at this particular phosphotyrosine. And I want to do some more details on this story, but I promise you I won't ask you a question, and I will not ask you the next question on all this detail, which on page 11, 18, B. Except that we're showing CD45 cuts that phosphotyrosine off. Mm -hmm. Now, if the B cell is, is in that, is, is in fact, here we show the B cell entering just a particular one antigen, a couple of antigens on a, on a bacteria, but there's no other ones here. Well, this could be a free floating protein that's being found by the protein molecule here. Then, here in these cases, we need. Um, um, a second signal, okay, I, I guess, uh, well, it's, it's called the, uh, it's called the B cell, B cell co-receptor. I guess that you could say it's kind of analogous to CD28 on T cells, or CD28 minus B7. Here, here, this, this co-receptor has three components. One of them is a complement receptor, C or a complement receptor, and it binds piece of C3, in this case bound to the bacteria. But if we just had a bacterial protein, because of the ongoing tick over that's going on in the blood, the bacterial proteins are likely to have been little pieces of C3 all over their surface too. And so this, if we see uh, the cognate antigen and it's been tagged with complement, that's the signal, okay, for the fire. We require some other additional stuff, like the C D and the don't worry about it. Just, uh, just remember that uh, we typically would require um, just a complement bracket to get full activation of an IgM B cell receptor. Okay, and, uh, and that's a this is a plasma cell 
filled with what the plant particular secreting antibody. Um, then we said that some B cells can be activated without the um, interleukin-4 cytokine that's released by T helper 2 cells. So we, get, so we have some B cells that do not require T cell help. Okay? These are called thymus independent, thymus referring to T cells and T cells from the thymus. So thymus independent antigen, and back, this, this famous bacterial body part we're talking about that, that binds, what was the receptor that recognizes LPS? Coal-like receptors. And coal-like receptors is itself a thymus independent antigen. Okay. And there'll be some B cells that recognize LPS, okay? But, um, but, but in general, um, uh, we have thymus independent antigens, and there are two kinds, uh, TI1 and TI2, okay? LPS is a TI1 antigen. And it is recognized by toll like receptor 4, okay, in conjunction with partner proteins, and and, uh, and, and we can get um, just firing of this toll like receptor pathway will substitute for the T helper 2 cytokines of these B cells. Okay, so, they, so they have the B cell receptor that's being that, that's uh, IgM is firing, but we need a second signal, and it can just be. LPS itself conserves a second signal. So we have uh, this is ground negative bacteria typically, so boom, we go back to work trying to find the, the, the ground negative bacteria. Um, it's, uh, let's see, these are typically uh, the thymus independent type 1 signaling. This is often done not by the standard. B2 B cells, but, but often it's, it's B1 cells that are responding to the thymus independent way here. Um, and then TI2 antigens here, okay, this is actually B1 cell here, closely clustered, and closely, closely spaced antigen all over the surface. Kind of like what we showed in the very first slide here in this one. That would cause clustering of the IgMs and, and, uh, and moving a signal so strong. We don't require IL-4 from T-hyper-2 cells. Uh, don't worry about this page. Don't worry about this page. Don't worry about this page. We did all this with the earlier tests. Don't worry about this page. This page. Skip this. Skipping, skipping, skipping. Skipping, skipping. Ah, you will remember. Page 12-2, the Bramble receptor is, okay. The Bramble receptor was IgG, especially one particular subclass of IgG, from the bloodstream into the extracellular tissue space. Okay. So we move this across, these cells make up the wall of the capillary here, these little thin flat capillary endothelial cells here. And we bind it, we move it in, and we want to ship it right out, and release it to the other side. This is transcytosis. The Bramble receptor moves it through IgG out of the bloodstream. Um, um, you'll know, remember where these different yes, uh, classes of Ig are found in the body of you will remember, for example, that the mother gives her newborn baby IgA2 in, the, in her milk, which will protect the baby. And the baby gets the mother's IgG while he's going in, and then which will move across the placenta. So the baby's getting the mother's IgG, and then after he's born, he gets the mother's IgA2. And IgE, remember, is all coding all the internal nucleophile surfaces of the body. And then uh, there's another receptor, you'll remember. There's the Bramble receptor for IgG, and there's the poly IG receptor for IgA2, dimeric IgA. I'm 
America IGA and is the Poly IGA Center. And then we're about 26. Don't worry about 12.7. Don't worry about 12.8. Don't worry about 12.9. And then we talked about FC receptors. Um, uh, um, the reason we do class switching is when we class switch, <coughs> we keep the, the business end of the antibody molecule, but we substitute the tail, okay, or the FC domain. And, and therefore, we get different cell types have receptors for different antibody tails. And it's useful to have some cells responding to an IgM and uh, some having you get different effector functions here. So, um, for example, um, uh, FC gamma receptors recognize IgG tails and that induces phagocytosis here. And uh, so these, 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 these FC receptors that bind the tail of the particular class of antibodies, they have signal transduction molecules which associate with them to give a particular response. Okay? And, and these FC receptors have Greek names which are the equivalent of, so in the G, we have the FC gamma G, gamma for G receptor. For FC epsilon, we have that binds to what type of antibody would FC epsilon bind to? GE. How about FC alpha? Right. So, so certain cells are going to want to. Now, in particular, the mast cells famously are loaded with these FC epsilon receptors, which have very high affinity for IgE. And so, every time you get a new worm or a new parasite, you'll make new IgA molecules, and then begin to accumulate over the years. On the surface of a mast cell, so the mast cell will have uh, thousands of copies of, of dozens of different IgEs against different parasites and so forth. So that later on, if that parasite comes into your nose or something like that, uh, the Ig the mast cells will, will have IgE on their surface. It'll bind that little parasite that got into your nose when you were swimming, and that will cause then the IgE mast cell to explosively release all, all these little things that make you profusely lose mucus and sneeze and uh, right. of course as we've said many times nowadays we don't have too many river parasites but we've got lots of pollen blowing up from Oklahoma, Kansas and so forth and that can be our IgE and we have allergies. Okay. Uh, and then I want you to remember that another function for FC receptor this is an FC gamma receptor. Okay. Um, uh, natural killer cells have an FC gamma receptor. It's the FC gamma receptor in Roman numeral three here. And it binds the tail of IgG. And so IgG binding to the nascent virus particles on the surface of the virus infected cell. Here's the virus, here are the viral transmembrane proteins in this infected cell or budding off of particles. And the natural killer cell uses FC gamma receptors to bind to the to the IgG tail, and that triggers signal transduction, the release of the killing molecules, the caspase activating stuff. So this is called um, ADCC. All right. Anybody know that? And then. Compliment. This should all be pretty fresh in your mind. I, I want you to know the basic story here. You know, C1Q um, binds to IgM, okay, or maybe IgG2 if you are close to the base, or preferably IgM. And then associated with C1Q or the RMS subunits, they're going to then cleave to the C2 and, and the C4 and, and, uh, and all that stuff. We talked about. Uh, uh, you know, we have C2B and then C4B, and then we have um, C3B that becomes 
We've got factor B, factor D, alternative C3 convertes, C3 being attached to the word. I don't think I'm going to add this. I have not in the past recently had an essay question where you lay out this whole pathway. I've asked you individual multiple choice and two false type questions. And if you have a general understanding of it, I think you'll do, you don't have to kill yourself trying to remember all the sequence of events and how to be evolved by factor D and all that crap. If you go to medical school, they'll have to kill you on this stuff there. You'll have to learn it. But even there, you'll forget it when you get out of your fourth year. So then we have C3 convertes, picking up a partner and becoming C5 convertes, or alternative C3 convertes, picking up a partner and becoming alternative C5 convertes. And we start cleaving C5. This is a whole new thing compared to what we were saying before. And then C5, when cleaved, initiates the formation of the plasma membrane puncturing holes, basically, which is just called osmotic bursting of the cell. So just remember that blah, 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 blah. You make C9, and C9 assembles a hormone core. It looks a lot like that core that the killer T cells create to prevent the plasmases. So you'll remember C9 resembles the perforate released by killer T cells. And then the small pieces that you get, they function as signaling molecules themselves. They are called anaphylic toxins. And then, of course, we control complement. I said the complement is like a match in the big hangar where they have all the high explosive stuff sitting around. Boy, it gets out of hand all too easily, so you've got to dampen it down. So we've got a lot of these blood-borne inhibitors working here. As soon as this C1Q stuff starts firing, these inhibitors are going to very quickly kill it, basically. C1, this guy here, and H, inhibitor. And then we also have C4 binding protein and factor H, which inactivate these convertases on our... Let's see here. It shows them this happening on microbial surface, but it really preferentially happens on our host cell surfaces. And then we have also our host cells have DAF and MCP, which are membrane proteins, which break down these convertase guys and stop the production of ever more amounts of C3B attacking everything. And we have protectin here, C59, that disassembles these pores. And then we come to the seasoning structure. Let's see here. I'm missing a vote. 13, 10, 11, and 12, we're just passing on by. Passing on by, passing on by, passing on by. Passing on by, coming to 13, 17. And this is the tick-over business I told you about. And the tick over here is, this is the so-called, the second major way. This is the alternative pathway. So we have a classical pathway activated by IgM. Then we have the alternative pathway activated by tick-over. And we're just constantly producing C3B, tagging everything. We have our own protective mechanism to neutralize it. But the bacteria that get in can't protect themselves, and they get tagged. And therefore, we make tasty from macrophages. And you should remember 
that um, when it comes to this alternative pathway and the takeover business, we have proparidin in our blood. Okay, proparidin <laughs> doesn't <laughs> doesn't act on our surface. Proparidin acts on the bacterial surfaces. Okay, and protects this convertase from being inhibited by um, things that GAF and MCP protect us. GAF and MCP that cause the destruction of the convergence on our own cells, they, they, they can't get at the C3 on the bacterial surface because proparidin is blocking uh, the action of these guys. And he said nothing, nothing, nothing. Uh, well, this gets us to uh, these systemic guys. I know one, six, and TNF alpha. I said, don't worry about this page 13.2. Um, you should just remember that TNF alpha can cause sepsis when blood-borne bacteria cause the liver to release huge amounts of TNF alpha, which causes a whole body to become inflamed and you know, it leads to blood clotting and death. And you just remember that some chemokine receptors are used by the HIV virus to get the entry into CD4 T cells. Um, now, again, now, the, these acutely acting uh, I mean, systemic uh, factors here, IL-1, 16 f alpha, under conditions of normal, not sepsis inducing, they're going to cause the liver to secrete uh, C-reactive protein and mannospinin protein. And C-reactive protein activates the, the, the classical pathway. So C-reactive protein, <coughs> at least by IOG in this picture or, or whatever, can't have. We put a C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein basically activates the classical pathway. But we also reduce this lectin, this mannose binding protein, and that, and that activates complement by the so called lectin pathway. We just know it at that level. And then, uh, uh, don't worry about the comparisons. And then comes a bunch of stuff on interferon. And I said the big thing here, I told you to know, know this. Okay, double-stranded RNA. Okay, is what turns on the expression of interferons in the infected cell. Just know that. Okay. And, uh, and then on page 1330, we're talking about natural killer cells here. Natural killer cells. They get turned on by these, these interferons and by these inflammatory cytokines here. We activate the natural killer cells and they start killing virus infected cells like crazy. How do the natural killer cells recognize that a cell is virus infected, is a virus infected cell? Down regulation of MHC1. And then I said, that's, that's the story. And I said, we don't have that test. And our work is done right on time. Thank you.